my past work with the U.S. government as well as with the RAND Corporation, I spent a considerable amount of time working on Afghanistan. I got a front row seat on a lot of policy making, and I also had access to a lot of people across the whole U.S. government, uh, State Department people, uh, military people, uh, everybody, like every part of the government you can imagine, as well as academics and think tankers and researchers at NGOs, uh, journalists, etc. I was able to spend a lot of time basically just reading and talking and living and breathing in Afghanistan for a certain period of time. While I was doing this, I heard a number of things being said, things that were taken as true, a lot of idées reçues, these sort of received ideas that were repeated so often that become sort of self-evident truisms. The problem is that a lot of what I heard wasn't true, or if it was true, these nonetheless, we didn't actually know because these truisms were based on nothing. Uh, I mean, maybe, but maybe not. But ultimately, these truisms were just accepted as if they were true, regardless of their actual veracity. Now, this might have sounded like uh, an academic problem, right? The kind of thing that historians write about when they write articles attacking each other's historiography or something like that. But, but this was the real world, because actual political decisions and policy decisions were being made based on these ideas. So they had consequences. So what I want to talk about in this video are these mistaken ideas that I believe had some really baleful consequences for the U.S. effort in Afghanistan. My name is Michael Sharkin, and welcome to my YouTube channel, Pax Americana, a conversation about world affairs, global conflict, military strategy, and anything else happens to be on my mind. Now, of course, this is a topic I could talk about for hours, and I, I, I don't want to do that uh, for lots of reasons. For one thing, I'm pretty sure that you're not going to watch it if this were hours long, and I don't have the time to make a four-hour video and then edit it, etc. So I'm going to try to boil it down to seven basic points, seven truisms or received ideas that I often heard that I thought were really very problematic. And uh, But one way of rephrasing this or, or sort of approaching this is that when I was with the government, and at RAND, working in Afghanistan, I never encountered an actual expert. Now, now bear with me. I am an expert in some things. I happen to be an expert in France. I have a PhD in French history. I went to graduate school in France, the École des Hautes-Études en Sciences Sociales. Uh, I lived in France. I speak the language. I've read widely in French literature. Uh, I had French girlfriends. Uh, at some point in my life, I knew the dance moves to the Claude François song, um, uh, and if you're French, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you probably even know the dance moves yourself, at least if, if you're of a certain age. The point is, I know what expertise looks like. I know what it feels like. I know what it means to actually be an expert. And I understood that I was not an Afghanistan expert. But the problem is that I was surrounded by people who actually thought they were Afghanistan experts. And yet none of them actually was. Because these people were ultimately expert in nothing. And thus, they didn't know the difference. They didn't really understand how little they actually knew about the place. I knew nobody who spoke an Afghan language. I know nobody who lived in Afghanistan. And I'm sorry, living on a U.S. or other NATO military base, beyond HESCO barriers and communicating to people through translators, like while you're wearing body armor, that does not count. So there were people who were expert in the military effort in Afghanistan and can go on and on about this PRT or that PRT or RC East versus RC South or this commander versus that commander or 101st Airborne Operations, blah, 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 blah. But nobody was actually in Afghanistan effort in the real sense of the, 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 the phrase, the way I understand said real expertise. Um, you know, again, this is not a problem intrinsically, except that if people don't understand how little they know, they can get themselves into into real trouble. I also want to add that a lot of what we knew about Afghanistan was really out of date. Uh, most of us were reliant on books written by anthropologists in the 1970s, or by anthropologists also who had done their field work in Afghanistan in the 1970s. This is a serious problem because Afghanistan evolved radically over the course of the 1980s and 1990s as a result of the Soviet wars and the civil wars and the forced displacement of millions of Afghans into refugee camps in Pakistan and Iran. Uh, this forced people to, it uprooted people from their local communities, threw them together into camps, put a number of them in schools. It, it, it changed really everything. And a lot of what happened also was that Afghanistan in the 2000s was, was besides having gone through this, all this trauma, uh, was rapidly urbanizing had uh, increasing, rapidly increasing rates of literacy, and, and ultimately was a very different place 
than the Afghanistan that scholars knew in the 1970s. The Afghanistan of the 1970s is an Ag Afghanistan that really nobody actually knew. And again, we're overly reliant on this out-of-date stuff from the 1970s. So what are these problems? What are these things that we didn't understand? Well, I'm reducing them here for the sake of conversation and for the sake of brevity to seven. So let's begin. First, it was a widely accepted truism that there was no such thing as an Afghan national identity. I heard this, among other things, from none other than Joe Biden when he was a senator. This informed his opinion about Afghanistan and is something that I believe he cited in when, as president, he decided to pull the plug on the war and pull the plug on the Afghan national government that we were trying to prop up. The problem is it's not true. There was, in fact, an Afghan national identity. A lot of it was, I believe, at the very least, the creation of the traumas, the shared traumas of the 1980s and the 1990s, of the forced displacement into the refugee camps in Iran and Pakistan. But it's more than that. There's also cultural, cultural commonalities. There's a shared culture. There's a shared um, literature, poetry. There are also shared religious pilgrimages and, and cultural events tied to religion, things that transcended confession, Shia, Sunni, and different tribes and different ethnicity, etc. There's a lot more to being Afghanistan than Americans insisted. This matters, really, because a key to nation building is building a national identity or shaping the national identity. If you believe that there's no such thing as an Afghan national identity and never will be such a thing as an Afghan national identity, you'll do nothing to try to understand it or address it, inform it, build it, use it to your advantage. If you believe that there is an Afghan national identity, then it becomes an opportunity because you can inform the Afghan national identity and you can identify people who are also trying to shape a certain kind of Afghan national identity and try to enhance them, try to enhance their message, to amplify their message and work with them. Because ultimately, when you're dealing with any kind of civil conflict or an insurgency, it's ultimately about rival narratives. What does it mean to be an Afghan? What does it mean to be a modern Afghan? Well, it comes down to how you identify yourself and what it means to be Afghan. This is really kind of the heart of the battle here. So this is important battle space, if you will, this kind of ideological battle space. Yet the United States government chose to completely ignore this, believing ultimately that there was no such thing, would never be such a thing, and thus paid no attention to any ideological component of the Afghan war, right, that, that we were involved with, which at the very least is a, is a missed opportunity of gigantic proportions. Uh, let's add to this. So number two, I heard often when I was trying to understand the decisions that were made by the United States uh, in the beginning, right, because in the beginning of the war, 2001 through 2003, we made all the calls. Who was going to rule? How are they going to rule? All that, that kind of stuff. U.S. stage managed all of that. But one of the things that was, was considered to be uh, a truism was that Afghanistan could not be ruled by a non-Pashtun. And everybody said that this was true. This was true. Why was it true? Well, because everybody says it's true. And the, but the problem here is that this, this is a truism based on absolutely nothing. Or the one example, the one argument that I ever heard from anybody was that proof that Afghanistan could not be ruled by a non-Pashtun is the fate of Habibullah Kalakani. Habibullah Kalakani was the lone non-Pashtun ruler of Afghanistan in the 20th century. Uh, he ruled in 1929. He was uh, deposed and executed within the same year, so his term was short. It was very short, and people would look at that and point to that and say, "Oh, look what happened to him! Obviously, a Tajik can't rule Afghanistan." Well, first of all, that was 1929. Things changed. Second of all, Habibullah Kalakani was uh, was unpopular for all sorts of reasons. So was the fact that he was not Pashtun really what drove his, his deposition or his execution? Is that the real reason why? Does this mean that because this happened to this guy that a lot of people didn't like for all sorts of reasons, it could never happen again? You could never have a non-Pashtun ruler? People assumed this was true, and this is what the U.S. acted on. So we went about the business of selecting, among other things, uh, selecting a Pashtun, because we were convinced that we needed a Pashtun to rule. It had to be a certain kind of Pashtun, and we come and come up with our own checklist, the result of which was the selection of Harmid Karzai. And I'm going to talk about that in, in, in a little bit. So the result of this, of course, is that we this informed our selection process. We're looking around. We decide for some reason that restoring the monarchy wouldn't work, although I never understood why. I don't know what the basis of that decision ultimately was. Uh, it was just a decision. I believe James Dobbins made that decision, but I'm not entirely 
clear. I'll talk about them in a second. Um, but we had this whole list, a uh, checklist of things that we thought that somebody needed to, to check in order to become president. And we cast about and we found Hamid Karzai and decided that he was the man. And he's the guy that the United States impose upon Afghanistan. Uh, ostensibly because he met this checklist, but I'll be honest, I'm convinced that the only reason why the U.S. picked Hamid Karzai is because he looked and sounded the part. He presented it himself in a certain way. He dressed a certain way. He spoke this beautiful English. And American diplomats are like, oh, yeah, this is the man, right? Because he's almost like out of Lawrence of Arabia, right? Uh, he just sort of fit. So we picked him. Whether or not he was at all the man to do the things that a guy in his position needed to do, which, by the way, he was not. But, he, you know, again, he looked and sounded the part. He was like straight from central casting. Three. Okay, we've picked Hamid Karzai based on criteria that are based on nothing. And then there's this belief that because we selected him or we put him through this process of a traditional lawyer jirga in 2002, which in our mind is like, oh, we check these cultural boxes, and then having elections, 2004, 2009, plus the 2005 legislative elections, et cetera, that all of this would have been sufficient to establish the legitimacy of the Karzai government. Now, I heard all this from the horse's mouth, the horse in this case being James Dobbins. Who is James Dobbins? James Dobbins was a career diplomat, a very distinguished man, and he was, I think, the man most responsible in that first five years for setting the, the course of U.S. policy and making a lot of these decisions. I frankly consider Dobbins to have been the architect of our failure. Um, he was a good man, a nice man, a thoughtful man, but the problem is that Dobbins, like again, like most of the people involved in all of this process, frankly, knew absolutely nothing about Afghanistan, even though they, they thought that they knew what they needed to know. So I met with Dobbins. Well, Dobbins was at the Rand Corporation, and I met with him, and I wanted support to do a study. And the study I wanted to do was I wanted to study Afghan political culture, and I wanted to use that as a basis for understanding what it would take for an Afghan ruler to establish legitimacy. What do Afghans really value, or what, what would really make them see a ruler as being legitimate? And Dobbins' response was fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating. He said to me, what makes you think that, Dob that, that Karzai is not legitimate? I mean, we had a lawyer, Jirga, and he was elected by, through two elections. Clearly, he's legitimate. And I looked at him, I thought, are you kidding me? Are you effing kidding me? Like, really, you think that just because, you know, with this magic wand, like, poof, we do a lawyer, Jirga, in these elections, that he, he's legitimate and his government's legitimate? That's not how it works. And I can say this as an historian, that's not how it's ever worked. This is not how any form of government becomes legitimate in the eyes of people. A lot more has to go into this, and it takes time. It takes uh, development of political culture. There, there are also things that have to be in play, all these stars that have to align in order for a guy to be legitimate. I mean, this view is it's just rubbish, historically speaking. But also, like, never mind history. Like, does anybody read Max Weber anymore? Like, I mean, come on. This is not how legitimacy is built. But this is what he thought. Now, next point, point number four. And this is interesting, too, because it sort of it contradicts point number three. So point number three is that, of course, Karzai is legitimate because we had elections. We've checked those boxes. Point number four is that his legitimacy is irrelevant. It doesn't actually matter. Now, let's unpack this. This is really very interesting. There is a widespread belief in the U.S. government and, and outside the U.S. government that, that it didn't really matter who was president or party politics or national upper politics because Afghans are, uh, to paraphrase Karl Marx and his 18th group mayor of Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, which is one of the greatest works of French history written. I mean, it's amazing. It's wrong. But it's, it's so pioneering that, that it's defined every French historiography ever since. Uh, Karl Marx is trying to understand the French peasantry in the 18, 1848. And he describes French peasants as these, these, these isolated, thoughtless, and coed uh, potatoes in a sack of potatoes. They're all alike, and they're all... They don't congeal into a hole, and they're all kind of mindless. This is the way Americans perceived Afghanistan, Afghans. They're all just a bunch of potatoes thrown into a sack of potatoes, and it doesn't really matter what goes on in Kabul or the parliament or any of these kinds of things because ultimately they're just these dumb potatoes. They're illiterate. They're archaic. And guess what? If they respond to anything, mostly it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They don't know from Karzai. They just care about their own immediate needs as defined by Maslow's hierarchy 
hierarchy, which in a weird way is sort of like oddly Marxist way of looking at people because it's all about like their 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 economic needs and their sense of security. As if there's nothing else, there's nothing to them in terms of identity or ideology or, or anything like that. But fine. So it didn't really matter. Now, this came up during the 2009 presidential election, and I was really worried about the presidential election. You see, uh, there were elections in 2004, and then I think the legislative elections were in 2005. The electoral, electoral process in the 2004 presidential election and the 2005 legislative election, I, I think that's the right date, was deeply, deeply flawed for a lot of reasons. And there was a pile, and I had them like in my office, of very, very good, well-documented studies by uh, NGOs and think tanks looking into everything that was wrong with the electoral process in Afghanistan, having to do with the terrible election law, uh, with, with the machinery and the institutions and everything. I mean, it's deeply, deeply flawed. And all that documentation should have given the U.S. and also the U.N., but mainly the U.S., because ultimately we're the driver of the whole effort, uh, a checklist of stuff to do. Like, oh, the election process was flawed. This is problematic because we should worry about the legitimacy of the, of the results of the election. So it behooves us to try to fix it so that the results of the election next time around are going to have more legitimacy in the eyes of Afghans because this presumably is important, right? But of course, the U.S. government didn't do any of those things, paid no attention whatsoever. I think because ultimately people in the U.S. government didn't believe that it mattered because it just doesn't matter. Now you have to ask, well, if you don't think the elections matter, then why do we bother holding the elections? Which, I mean, that's another question. But either way, it's like we care enough about the elections to spend a lot of money to hold the elections, but we don't care enough about the elections to actually do anything to ensure that the elections are a credible process because we don't really think it matters. All right, like this makes sense. But anyways, I was all concerned. And I thought like, look, at the very least, these elections represent an opportunity. If these are good elections, this will help enhance the legitimacy of whatever emerges from the elections, whoever wins the election. Or we let it be a, a, a dumpster fire, and this will undermine the legitimacy of whoever wins the elections. And I got told by lots of people in lots of places, well, it doesn't really matter because the elections are irrelevant, because the legitimacy is irrelevant. Why? Because Afghans are just you know, responding to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and they don't really care. It doesn't really matter. And they don't know from cars either. They're, they're unaware. Like it's as if they don't have radios or text messages on their phones or satellite television. They, they don't know. They don't care. They're just potatoes in a sack of potato. Okay, fine. Now, I, I thought that the correct way, instead of assuming that the Afghan government, because we set it up and we checked these boxes like elections, that it was good to go, right? I thought a better way of understanding it was that this was really a revolutionary government that we had stood up or a counter-revolutionary government, depending on your point of view. You know, the communist regime was a revolutionary government that overthrew the monarchy, and then came the, the, the warlords and then the Taliban. So, you know, you could lose track whether or not you're counter-revolutionary or revolutionary. But the point is, is that any good scholar of, let's say, the French Revolution can tell you a whole lot about what makes a government illegitimate or legitimate. How does the French Revolutionary government become legitimate? or not legitimate, or how does it fall, or how does the Napoleonic regime achieve any kind of legitimacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Historians can tell you all about this. But believe me, the answer is not simply holding two elections and maybe doing this ritual of the lawyer jurga, never mind the fact that all of this was stage managed by a foreign government, the United States. It just doesn't work that way. But you know, the United States is like, we don't know, we don't care, it doesn't really matter because it just doesn't matter because we, think that Afghans are just potatoes in a sack of potatoes, and they're just responding to Maslow's hierarchy. Now, associated with this is a, another thing that I think that we got wrong, which is that, that people told me over and over again that Afghans really only voted for warlords and according to ethnic lines. Now, let's talk about the warlords first. The warlords thing was an, an extraordinary act of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You see, there's very good evidence that uh, around 2001, if Afghans had anything in common, it was their hatred of the warlords, because the warlords destroyed their country in the 1990s. They were sick of them. And honestly, the best thing the United States could have done is call all the warlords together in a summit. This is how I envision it goes down. You're, the, you're Dobbins, right? 
Dobbins calls all the warlords together. He got them in this room together in Kabul. And then you step outside, you pull, pull out your cell phone, and you call the F-16 that's circling somewhere above, and you drop the JDAM, and you've taken care of the warlords. That would have done more for Afghanistan than probably anything else that we did. Needless to say, we didn't do that. But what we did do is we took a marginalized and hated cast of characters, and we treated them as if they're the only people who mattered, right? So there was always this clear narrative that never mind the national government, the constitution, and elections, the national assembly, blah, 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 blah. All that matters in Afghanistan are the warlords, and if you want to achieve anything, you have to team up with the warlords. It wasn't true until we made it true. Because we saw them and treated them as if they're the only important people, they thus became important. Notwithstanding the very strong evidence that people hated the warlords, the people wanted a different kind of leadership, and they didn't want this. They didn't want this, but we didn't really give them a chance to do something else because we empowered the warlords because of our belief that they were powerful. But we're the ones that made them so, right? Whereas they didn't have to be. That wasn't actually the, the situation in 2001, 2002. But that's all on us. That's what we did. Now let's talk about the ethnicity thing. The ethnicity thing is interesting in that uh, we, it's like identity politics almost, but like we imposed a sort of identity politics on Afghanistan. So we approached the country believing that ethnicity was everything. And what we did is we set about trying to divide everybody. You're Tajik, you're Turk, you're Uzbek, you're Pashtun. And, oh, you're Pashtun. Then you must be this tribe or that tribe or this sub-tribe. You're the Barak Zai or the Blah Zai or the this, that Zai or that Zai. And everything was sort of organized like that. And there was a lot of people in the U.S. government who really studied the, the tribal hierarchies and they try to they seem to think that if you could just sort of get these tribal decoder rings then you can understand everything like all uh, Afghan politics politics would become transparent and that this will somehow guide your conduct and enable you to make the right decisions right meanwhile there is a national assembly by the way which the United States government completely and totally ignored like you've got a bunch of legislators over there doing stuff and talking stuff why don't we actually listen to them instead of like working on our decoder rings and at one point, I said to somebody who was involved in the U.S. government in this effort to just really understand. It was a scholarly endeavor to try to understand the tribal ins and outs. And I said to this person, look, all you're doing is you're resurrecting and imposing and re re reifying 19th century British imperial taxonomies. You think you are accurately describing reality, but what you're actually doing is shaping that reality. And all I could say is this person looked at me like I was speaking Mandarin and completely dismissed me. And that was one of those moments where sometimes people would pat me on the head and say, oh, Shurkin, isn't he cute? He used to be a history professor. I was like, great, this, this is just great. But anyways, we showed up thinking that ethnicity was really important, and thus we reified it by making it important. And I imagine us sort of showing up and asking the Afghans, well, what kind of Afghan are you, right? Because we're trying to bin them according to these, frankly, the are 19th century British imperial taxonomies, right? And the Afghans are like, uh, okay, I guess I'm this, I guess I'm that. The reality being, of course, is ethnicity, first of all, often it's a social contract. Ethnic identities are very fluid, they're very complex. People have multiple identities, they have layered identities. There's a lot going on. But it's possible to reify them to make the, and harden the lines, even if they shouldn't be hardened. But this is something that, what, what, that, that we did. And I think one result is that, well, first of all, we didn't quite understand what was going on. This blinded us to evidence that ethnicity wasn't that big of a deal. And it also encouraged a kind of policy or approach to Afghan politics that also undermined the project of nation building, the project of trying to create unity and trying to make the Afghan government um, legitimate, right? Because we're dividing and we're working on warlords and doing all sorts of stuff, whereas maybe we could have been rallying Afghans around this new government. Now, this brings me to the seventh and final point that I want to make. It's something that, it, this will be weird, bear with me. I constantly heard from the U.S. government, particularly from folks in the State Department, that the United States did not interfere in Afghanistan's domestic and internal politics, which meant that there's a very wide range of things that we would not do. For example, we were not going to intervene in the presidential election in 2009. We were not going to cheat. We were not going to try to influence the outcome, even though we absolutely could have. 
And while this sounds noble and pious, because it doesn't sound like a good thing for us to be doing, to be screwing around people's elections. However, it's a lie, right? We are not intervening in internal domestic politics. What are you even talking about? We overthrew the previous government. We imposed a new government. We imposed the constitution. We picked the guy, imposed him as the president. We imposed the, the electoral laws. We imposed the entire machinery. We imposed all of this. Meanwhile, we were occupying the country militarily. We had tens of thousands of people in the country killing people, right? Throwing around money, working with warlords, working with these people, working with that people, throwing around cash, disrupting Afghan life, the Afghan political eco ecosystem in a thousand ways. And then to pretend that we're not intervening, we're not interfering, is absurd and very odd. And I tend to think that actually when you're fighting a war in a country, all things should be on the table, right? Maybe it would behoove us to manipulate politics. Maybe bribing legislators, legislators shouldn't be off the table, right? Because it matters. Or maybe bribing the president or threatening the president or replacing the president or doing something, right? Like if you're killing people, if you're dropping bombs on people and killing them, why is it not okay to interfere? Not only that, but by pretending not to interfere in the Afghan presidential election 2009, we were denying to ourselves the reality to which we absolutely were interfering. What do I mean by this? Well, the mantra of the U.S. State Department at the time was that we support the process, not any particular candidate. And people would ask us all the time, you know, who do you support? Who do you support? And the U.S. government would always say, oh, we don't support anybody. We support the process and not the, any individual candidate. Okay. We didn't want to be on the record, of, among other things, of saying that we supported Karzai. But the thing is that everybody understood that to be the case. Why? Well, because Karzai had spent the past five years building machinery, an electoral machinery, uh, to make sure that he got elected. And this is just the way it always works. So this process that we supported and in which we said we refused to intervene, but we were protecting by virtue of just being there, this process was rigged. So we were saying, we are not going to interfere. We support a process that ultimately is rigged. And even though we ostensibly aren't supporting any particular candidate, implicitly, de facto, we're back in Karzai. And that's the way everybody understood it. So when the State Department would say, we support the process on any individual candidate, it was a lie that only the State Department believed, and nobody else did. And so all very odd. And when I look at this, I think this is just very odd. Why not? Like, first of all, and this is a very strange analogy, it's kind of like saying pleading your virginity because you had uh, only performed anal sex, right? So it's like, oh, but I'm still a virgin. Right. So when the U.S. is saying, oh, but we don't intervene in Afghan domestic politics, that's exactly what we're doing. Right. We're pleading our virginity when it's absolutely completely absurd. So am I saying that we should have treated, cheated, that we should have rigged the elections? Well, it was rigged. It's just we let it happen. So it's like a sin of omission. And is the sin of omission any better than a sin of commission? Like, is that better than if we had rigged the elections? Well, frankly, given the fact that Karzai in round two, we knew by seeing him in the first administration, we knew that he was a failure. We knew that he was not doing the things that he needed to do as the president of this fledgling country with very shaky legitimacy. We knew he wasn't doing these things, or we should have known because we should have cared about his legitimacy, but we weren't really. Then it seems to me that replacing him might have been a good idea. And we could have done it because there were, were alternatives that we never seriously considered. Why? Because promoting any of these alternatives would have meant interfering in Afghan domestic politics, which is something we were doing anyways. So does any of this make sense? So ultimately, what are we left with? First of all, I believe that there's nothing, there's no substitute for actual expertise. Or in the absence of actual expertise, of being modest about one's own knowledge, if one's not an expert, I mean, that's fine. I mean, it's like, okay, we don't have Afghanistan experts because it's not like, you know, lots of American students go to France every year to study. It's easy. It's fun. Very few people want to go to Afghanistan. It's understandable. It's hard to find actual Afghan experts. That's fair. 
but the key is to be aware of that, to sort of not get fooled into thinking that we're Afghan experts because we read a few books and, and you know, we saw the kite flyer or whatever the, that, that movie is. Um, great book, by the way. Uh, you know, so we know all about Afghanistan unless we're going to say all sorts of crazy things about Karzai and what he is and isn't and Pashtuns and Tajiks and all this kind of stuff. The other the big the other big takeaway is that the U.S. approach was often based on assumptions that either were not true, or simply not tested, and thus much of the U.S. approach was based on false premises or fundamentally contradictory. For instance, this argument that on one hand X, Y, and Z were sufficient to establish the legitimacy of a government, therefore we were going to do those things while with the other hand saying legitimacy doesn't actually matter, so we have a green light to do all these things that are going to undermine state legitimacy. For example, every time we ever did anything with any of the warlords, we were undermining Afghan state legitimacy. Every single time. So what are we trying to accomplish? Our very own counterinsurgency doctrine at the time, the famous FM3-24, uh, really argued that in this population-centric approach, what really matters is that the people and legitimacy and fostering the legitimacy of the government. And yet we were pretending that didn't matter or doing things that directly undermined it. So our doctrine thus, whatever you have to say about it, pro or con, and I have a lot of con things to say about it, but we're not even following the doctrine or we're undermining the doctrine. And ultimately, what are we actually hoping to achieve? You know, if you ask me, Michael, are you surprised that the war turned out the way it did? My answer is no. Absolutely not. I knew this was going to happen, and, and i got to be honest. I declared the war loss in 2009 when Karzai was reelected uh, and basically reimposed upon the Afghan people by the United States, despite clearly being a losing proposition. Thank you very much. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to uh, seeing you in the next video. Oh, before I forget, I've got some links in the description of stuff to read. Plus, you can find me uh, on Twitter and Substack, Pax Americana. Again, link in the description. And you could also always find me at michaelsharkin.com. Thank you very much.